Reading through the Bible in one year, August 28th, 1 Samuel chapter 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Lamentations chapter 5, and Psalm 36. David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came to Jonathan and asked, But what have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? And Jonathan said to him, no, no, you won't die. Listen, my father doesn't do anything great or small without telling me. So why would he hide this matter from me? This can't be true. But David said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor with you. He has said, Jonathan must not know of this or else he will be grieved. David also swore, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. So David told him, Look, tomorrow is the new moon. I'm supposed to sit down and eat with the king. Instead, let me go, and I'll hide in the countryside for the next two nights. If your father misses me at all, say, well, David urgently requested my permission to go quickly to his hometown, Bethlehem, for an annual sacrifice there involving the whole clan. If he says, good, then your servant is safe. But if he becomes angry, you will know he has evil intentions. Deal uh, kindly with your servant, for you have brought me into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I have done anything wrong, then kill me yourself. Why take, rather, why take me to your father? No, Jonathan responded. If I ever find out my father has evil intentions against you, wouldn't I tell you about it? So David asked Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Well, he answered David, Oh, come on, uh, let's go to the countryside. So both of them went out to the countryside. By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will sound out my father by this time tomorrow or the next day. If I find out that he is favorable toward you, will I not send for you and tell you? If my father intends to bring evil on you, may the Lord punish Jonathan and do so severely if I do not tell you and send you away so that you may leave safely. May the Lord be with you, just as he was with my father. If I continue to live, show me kindness from the Lord. But if I die... Don't ever withdraw your kindness from my household, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Jonathan once again swore to David in his love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Again, people say, well, this is proof that they're gay. No, not all love for other people has to be homosexual love. I have people in my family that I love dearly. I have friends that I love dearly that I will do anything for. They could call me up now and I will fly wherever they happen to be and I will take care of whatever it is they need to be taken care of. And I will do this in a moment without even questioning. This is the kind of love they have. They had a covenant with one another because they were good friends, extremely close friends. And this is the same type of thing that we see. But again, every time I get to this text, this is where people come to me and say, well, clearly David was gay. No, clearly he's not. This is how people spoke of one another. Let's continue. Then Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon. You'll be missed because your seat will be empty. The following day, hurry down and go to the place where you hid. On the on this day, the incident began, and stay beside the rock, Ezel. That's the name that they had for the rock. I will shoot three arrows beside it, as if I'm aiming at a target. Then I will send a servant and say, go and find the arrows. Now, I have ex if I expressly say to the servant, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them. Well, then come, because as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no problem. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord is sending you away. As for the matter be, uh, you and I have spoken about, the Lord will be a witness between you and me forever. So David hid in, in the countryside. At the new moon, the king sat down to eat the meal. He sat at his usual place on the seat by the wall. 
And Jonathan sat facing him, and Abner took his place beside Saul, but David's place sat empty. Saul did not say anything because he thought something unexpected has happened. He must be ceremonially unclean. Yes, that's it. He's unclean. However, the day after the new moon, the second day, David's place was still empty. And Saul asked his son, Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to the meal either yesterday or today? Well, Jonathan answered, David asked for my permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, please let me go because our clan is holding a sacrifice in the town. and My brother has told me to be there. So now, if I have found favor with you, let me go so I can see my brothers. That's why he didn't come to the king's table. Then Saul became angry with Jonathan and and shouted, You son of a perverse woman! Don't I know that you are siding with Jesse's son to your own shame and to to the disgrace of your mother? Every day Jesse's son lives on earth. You and your kingship are not secure. Now send for him and bring him to me. He must die. And that's what he is concerned about. He wants to make sure that his son, his progeny, will continue to reign as king in the land. Jonathan knows that David will be king, because everyone else in the land knows this. So he's, our, he's uh, committed to serving God rather than serving what his dad wants him to serve. And this, this battle that we see right here, this will continue uh, to, to cause problems for them. Like to the end of the kingship and the end of the kingdom. When uh, in, in, in the Babylonian captivity, we'll see that take place. The same struggle between the people. So just kind of pack that away in the back of your mind as we're going to get there later. But this is kind of the first real sign of it that we're seeing. So Jonathan answered his father back, why? Why is he to be killed? What has he done? Then Saul threw his spirit, Jonathan, his own son, to kill him. So he knew that his father was determined to kill David. He got up from the table fiercely angry and did not eat any more food uh, that second day of the new moon. For he was grieved because of his father's shameful behavior toward David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the countryside for uh, the appointed meeting with David. A young servant was with him, and he said to the servant, uh, Run and find the arrows I'm shooting. And as the servant ran, uh, Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. And he came to the location of the first arrow that Jonathan had shot. But Jonathan called to him and said, The arrow is beyond you, isn't it? Then Jonathan called to him, Hurry up and don't stop. Jonathan's servant picked up the arrow and returned to his master. He did not know anything, only uh, Jonathan and David knew the arrangement. Then Jonathan gave his equipment to the servant who was uh, with him and said, Go, take it back to the city. When the servant was gone, David got up from the south side of the stone, Azel, and fell face down on the ground and paid homage three times. Then he and Jonathan kissed each other and wept with each other, though David wept even more. Jonathan then said to David, Go in the assurance the two of us pledged in the name of the Lord, when we said, The Lord will be a witness between you and me, between my offspring and your offspring forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went into the city. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 now. Paul continues, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, 
a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because they had not, uh, rather, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor uh, ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things uh, for those who love him. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since God, sorry, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of him who comes from God, so that we may understand what uh, has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the wisdom without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, since it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it, since it is, it is evaluated spiritually. This is, again, why your friends and, and people that you love and care about, but who are not Christians, why they can't understand the things of God. Because your spirit has to be changed for you to understand these things. That's what it means when it says that it's foolishness to him. It's stupid. The person without the spirit does not receive what comes from God's spirit because it is stupidity to him. He is not able to understand it. Not that you just didn't say it right. Not that you need to, to go down the Romans road maybe and explain it that way. Not that you need to have your pastor talk to him and then maybe he'll get it then. He won't understand it because he can't understand it. Not until God does the work to open his heart to understand these things. The spiritual, sorry, the spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything. And yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. Why? Because that, that means that the, the heathens in the world can't evaluate our spiritual state before God because they don't even understand it. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. Move on to Lamentations chapter 5 now. Lord, remember what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are widows. We must pay for the water that we drink, and our wood comes at a price. We are closely pursued. We are tired, and no one offers us rest. We made a treaty with Egypt and with Assyria to get enough food. Our ancestors sinned. They no longer exist, but we bear their punishment. Slaves rule over us, and no one rescues us from them. We secure our food at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is, in, is as hot as an oven uh, from the ravages of hunger. Women have been raped in Zion, virgins in the cities of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Young men labor at millstones. Uh, boys stumble under loads of wood. The elders have left the city gate. The young men, their music. The joy has left our hearts. Rather, joy has left our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our heart is sick. Because of these, our eyes grow dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate. Uh, yeah, which lies desolate and has jackals prowling in it. You, Yahweh, are enthroned forever. Your throne en endures from generation to generation. Why do you continually forget us? 
abandon us for our entire lives. Lord, bring us back to yourself so that we may return. Renew our days as in former times, unless you have completely rejected us and are intensely angry with us. Now, Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked person. Dread of God has no effect on him. For with his flattering opinion of himself, he does not discover and hate his iniquity. The words from his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. Even on his bed, he makes malicious plans. He sets himself on a path that is not good and does not reject evil. Lord, your faithful love reaches to heaven, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your judgments like the deepest sea. Lord, you preserve people and animals. How priceless your faithful love is, God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They are filled from the abundance of your house. You let them drink from your refreshing stream, for the wellspring of life is with you. By means of your light, we see light. Spread your faithful love over those who know you and your righteousness over the upright in heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant come near me, or the hand of the wicked drive me away. There, the evildoers have fallen. They have been thrown down and cannot rise. All right, that is all for today. Um, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.